Okay. Well, it's a particular pleasure to introduce, introduce this afternoon's speaker, Alex Filipenko, the noted astronomer from the University of California in Berkeley. He's in Aspen for several weeks now, participating in a workshop on the properties of neutron stars. And th these are stars that are the size of Aspen. If you imagine compressing the sun down to the size of Aspen, they're, they're stars with many unusual properties. Uh, Alex is, is unusual in our workshop in that he's one of the few people who actually looks through telescopes to learn about stars. <laughs> uh, and as, as such, he's played a, a critical role in many of the spectacular discoveries of the cosmos in the, in the last decades. He was part of both teams that discovered the uh, thoroughly, thoroughly unexpected acceleration of the universe. The galaxies just uh, not only moving apart from each other, but doing faster and faster. This was a uh, discovery that led, that was recognized by the Nobel Prize in 2011 to the leaders of both teams that made the discovery. And he also received, along with all, all the other team members, the Breakthrough Prize in Fundamental Physics in 2015. He studies black holes, quasars, and other unusual astrophysical objects out, out there. And on Tuesday, in a workshop on neutron stars, he gave a fascinating talk on what are known as black widow pulsars. Black widows, of course, are spiders that consume their mates. Uh, and these, these are stars that blink on and off, perhaps up to 1,000 times per second, and at the same time are, are devouring the companion star that they're orbiting around here. Well, uh, were I to tell you about Alex's honors, there would be too little time for his talk. So let me mention that he's a member of the National Academy of Sciences, which is one of the most prestigious honors to science, the scientists can get in the United States. And as well, he's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. So let me, without further ado, welcome Alex Filipenko to tell us about the all-American total solar eclipse of August 2017. Alex. And I'm so happy to see a full house here. Wow, that's, that's fantastic. I'm even happier to be in Aspen for a month. This is a wonderful place to be. And in particular, the Center for Physics is just outstanding in the quality of the people that it attracts and, of course, the, the quality of the, of the venue and the whole surroundings. Gordon is right when he says that discussing physics topics while wandering around in the hills is a very fruitful way to make progress in one's field. So we love coming here. We came here for three weeks last summer, and I try to finagle my way over here at least once every few years, if not consecutive years. So I'd like to tell you today about the great all-American total solar eclipse that's, that's coming up, a wonderful opportunity to witness a truly magical phenomenon. And, you know, I'll end up sounding a little bit like a nut to you, a lunatic, if you'll pardon the pun, but it's a very moving experience. And once you have seen a total solar eclipse yourself, you will probably join that camp of lunatics because total solar eclipses are really quite different from partial solar eclipses, and those are fun to watch as well. Anyway, anyone here has seen a total solar eclipse? To total, yes, okay, good. Partial, that's good, but uh, anyway, uh, so, so here's the sun normally, and you shouldn't look at it. I mean, don't worry if you glanced at it for a fraction of a second. Most of us have done that and not gone blind, but do not make a habit at staring at the uneclipsed sun. But every once in a while, this sort of a thing happens, and here you have the partial phases and then the total solar eclipse and then partial phases once again. The total solar eclipse occurs when the moon is exactly lined up with the sun, revealing this wonderful, tenuous, very hot corona. The corona of the sun is the outer atmosphere. It has a temperature of a few million degrees, but the density of the gas is so low that if you were to immerse yourself into the corona close to the sun and block the sun's disk with some sort of a shield, you would actually freeze to death because you would be losing energy at a greater rate than you're gaining energy. The particles that hit you would hit you with very high speeds. They have very high temperatures, but there are so few of them hitting you that you would actually freeze to death. But don't try this at home, okay, because it's, it's really hard to block the disk of the sun. Anyway, long ago, eclipses were events to be feared. Uh, that's still the case in, in some cultures and some societies, primarily those that are not well educated. After all, as I'll show you, these things are very rare and 
So any given place gets them only very, very rarely, and there's very little record of previous ones. And so the people alive at the time just think that the sun is, is being devoured either by a monster, a dragon, or perhaps the gods are angry and are taking the sun away. Um, these are some of, the, some of the pictures from long ago. This is from China of a dragon devouring the sun. And so people would, would do all kinds of things to either appease the angry gods or scare away the monsters and dragons. They would beat pots and pans. This is a more recent picture. <laughs> they would um, sacrifice animals of various sorts. And you know, these kinds of techniques worked every time, right? <laughs> the sun would always come back, so can't argue with success. Anyway, the modern explanation of, of an eclipse is, of course, less colorful than this, but it doesn't in any way detract from the beauty and the awe and the truly moving experience that viewing totality and the moments leading up to it uh, really is. The explanation, as I've mentioned, is that the moon occasionally gets in a perfectly straight line between the sun and earth. And so it casts a shadow on earth. Now this is an amazing thing because the sun is 400 times bigger in diameter than the moon is. But it's also 400 times farther away. And that means they look the same size in the sky. They subtend the same angle. And whenever you have a relationship such that the ratio of distances is equal to the ratio of sizes, two objects will look the same size in terms of the angle that they take up in the sky. So here's a tennis ball, which is twice the diameter, almost exactly, of a ping pong ball. Looks bigger than that, but it's only twice. It's, I think, because your brain thinks in terms of a volume, which is more like a factor of eight. But anyway, it's twice the radius, twice the diameter. And if I align these things to be two to one in distance, then the ping pong ball looks the same size as the tennis ball, okay? Now, if the ping pong ball is too far away, then it looks too small. It doesn't quite cover the tennis ball. If it's too close, then it more than covers the tennis ball. But if the ratio of distances is equal to the ratio of sizes, I think you can see right now that that's approximately right, then they look the same size in the sky. And as far as we can tell, that's purely coincidental. In fact, the moon is, is uh, moving out, well, th this fundamental ratio is not coincidental, but the particular one with the sun and the moon is coincidental. The moon used to be much closer to Earth. In fact, it was formed quite close to Earth. It's been gradually moving away from Earth. It now moves away at about the rate at which fingernails grow, also at about the rate at which tectonic plates move, roughly a few centimeters per year. So in fact, in about half a billion years, the moon will always be too far away, no matter where it is in its elliptical orbit, and it'll be not big enough to completely cover the sun's bright disk. So total solar eclipses will no longer be possible in half a billion years. You had better see one soon because time is running out. Now some last longer than others because in its elliptical orbit, sometimes the moon is closer than average to Earth and so it looks bigger than average, it looks a little bit bigger than the sun and it takes several minutes for it to cross the sun. Whereas when the moon is near average or a bit farther than average from Earth, then it's just barely big enough to cover the sun for just a few moments, and so you get a very short eclipse. But the totality never lasts more than about seven and one-third minutes, and that's very, very rare. Most of them are typically two or three minutes. My average over 15 total solar eclipses has been about two minutes. So you snooze, you lose. You go to the bathroom well before it reaches totality, okay? Anyway, what, the moon... What time of day? Oh, well, I'll get into all that, the time of day and all that. That depends on where you are. The time of day is very important. Yes, very important. And yeah, I'll get to that. So you, you see this beautiful corona, all right, this outer atmosphere of the sun. Now, normally the sun looks something like this through a filter. It's actually a white star. In fact, sunlight is defined to be white light. It just looks yellow when it's close to the horizon because violets, blues, and greens have been preferentially absorbed and scattered out. But anyway, there it is through a yellow filter. 
and here the moon is coming across slowly. The partial phases take an hour to an hour and 20 minutes or so, something like that. All right, and then you get something known as Bailey's beads. Now that's sunlight shining through valleys between mountains on the lunar limb. You know, there are craters and there are, there are rims and things, and so you can see the moon's edge is not a smooth billiard ball, it's corrugated because of the various craters and mountains. And when the moon is exactly lined up with the edge of the sun, you can get lots and lots of these little bits of sunlight shining through, the so-called Bailey's beads. They're hard to catch because they only last a second or two. But in photographs, if you take many rapid fire photos, you can see them. I think I'll take, since there's so many questions, I think I'll take questions near the end just because I'm likely to cover many of the things anyway. And then if there are questions on topics I haven't covered or if you need me to clarify something, I'll be happy to do so. Plus, some people need to go off and make, dinner, uh, make it to their dinner reservations and stuff. Okay, the last little bit of the sun to be visible before the moon completely covers the photosphere or disk is often overexposed in photographs, and so it looks like a, a jewel, a diamond, but the ring formed by the inner part of the corona and a little layer called the chromosphere starts becoming visible. So you get a ring with a jewel, a diamond. This is the diamond ring effect. There are two of them, one at the beginning, one at the end. They last a few seconds. This to me is perhaps the most magical moment of the eclipse because things are changing so rapidly. That's when the sky is darkening very quickly and all that because, you know, before when even one or two percent of the sun was still shining, well, that's still quite a bit of sunlight and your eyes can adjust to that. But when this last little tenth of a percent or hundredth of a percent of the sun is visible, then it starts getting really dark and you're looking at this diamond ring and everyone's going ooh and ah. You'll hear in a video in a minute. So um, here's the chromosphere. Here was a case where the moon was almost exactly the same size as the sun. My wife and I, Noelle, actually got engaged at this eclipse in 2005, that's right. And so you could see the chromosphere, a thin little layer between the surface, the so-called photosphere and the corona. You could see the chromosphere sphere all the way around. And, and that was an eclipse that only lasted 30 seconds because the moon and the sun were essentially identical in size. Um, if you zoom in on the chromosphere, you can see little tongues of gas coming out. Those are called prominences. They are relatively mild eruptions from the sun's surface or subsurface layers. They're nowhere near as powerful as solar flares and coronal mass ejections, but they're fun to look at. And then you see the inner corona, the middle corona. These are different eclipses. The corona changes in shape because the charged particles follow the magnetic field lines of the sun, and the magnetic field of the sun changes with time. And then here's the outer corona, three different eclipses. Now, in this photograph, you really only see the outer corona. You don't see the structure in the inner corona and the mid corona very well. But with your eyes, you see something closer to that. This is a combination of photographs having different exposures, and this is now done by people doing digital photography with, C with CMOS devices. You get a digital image, you can combine different images, and you get much more of what your eye sees. Your eye has a fantastic dynamic range compared to a single photograph. And you all know this, and I know this, because just the other day we were taking a walk in the hills, and I tried to take a photograph of this scene. And I saw that, as I've seen hundreds of times, I could either expose well on the aspens and the pine trees here, but overexpose the sky, or I could get the sky correctly and see essentially nothing down in the grassy field there, right? This is the same view. Look at this tree here, right? Look at this structure here. It's the same view. I just exposed on the sky versus exposing on the grassy field below. A single photograph doesn't come close to capturing everything, but your eye has this incredible dynamic range, and so you see the different brightnesses in the corona all at the same time. It's really, really wonderful. So this is where seeing is actually better than uh, a bunch of photographs. And plus, the temperatures are changing, the amount of light is changing, people are going crazy, animals are going crazy, so, or they're at least confused. Um, here's a photograph composed by Miloslav Druckmuller, who truly 
took an amazing series of photographs showing the corona going way out to here and showing even some stars. And in the Q&A, if you wish, you can ask me about Einstein's prediction that starlight is bent by moving through the warped space-time of, of the sun. And, and that was first confirmed in 1919 by Arthur Eddington by measuring the apparent positions of stars during an eclipse and not during an eclipse. Okay, here you see what's called the shadow cone. This is the, the shadow of the moon, which through something as thin as Earth's atmosphere is actually a cylinder to a good first approximation. But perspective effects make it look like it's diverging from a point, um, just regular vanishing point type effect, like what you see when you're looking down parallel railroad tracks. You know they're parallel, but they appear to diverge from this point. Plus, there's a little curve there, I think. But anyway, you see 360 degrees around you, twilight sky colors, not just in the west or in the east, but all around. Because the path of totality is only some tens of miles wide, 60 to 70 for the upcoming eclipse. And so you're never more than a few tens of miles away from the edge. And so a little bit of sunlight, maybe 1% of the sunlight of a partially eclipsed sun is hitting regions that are 20 miles away from you and then scattering through the atmosphere toward you the violets, blues, and greens get absorbed and scattered out for the same reason that they do during sunset. But this is happening all the way around you, and so you see these 360-degree twilight colors. And I usually spend a couple of seconds out of the two minutes just taking a look around me. Stars come out, planets come out. It's not super dark during an eclipse, but it's like twilight, various shades of twilight, depending on how deeply into the path you are uh, and also uh, how wide the path is. I have a friend that spends some time trying to figure out what is the faintest star that he can see. And I tell him, hey, you know, why don't you just look at the eclipse? We can look at the faintest stars at night. Who cares? But anyway, the brightest stars are easily visible, and you will notice that. And you'll almost certainly notice Venus, which always hangs around somewhere in the vicinity of the sun. All too soon, the eclipse is over. There's a lot to look at in a few minutes. That's another reason for seeing more than one of them. The chromosphere starts coming out, diamond ring, underexposed and overexposed. So you can see the chromosphere and the corona. Uh, and then for an hour and a quarter or so, this happens. But on the outbound journey of the moon, hardly anyone cares. A few people do. They're sitting there. Don't bother me. I want to experience the full two and a half hours. But most everyone else is partying and just having a great time. Okay. Although on the way in, the anticipation climbs and, you know, and people are very uh, keyed up. So my first total solar eclipse was uh, in 1979, the last total solar eclipse to have hit anywhere in the continental US. Yes, folks, it's been 38 years. 99 years since the path went coast to coast. And uh, the forecast, the weather forecast was miserable. It was raining on our way from Portland out to the Cascade Mountains. Um, there was a stream of people heading from west to east, just like we were evacuating Portland. An occasional trucker in the pouring rain going the other direction, probably wondering, what are all these people doing leaving Portland, okay? But we were all heading to the Cascades where the meteorologist said that if you have a snowflake's chance in hell of seeing this eclipse in February in the Pacific Northwest, it's going to be just east of the ridge of the Cascade Mountains. So that's where, we were, where everyone went. It was completely overcast until just a bit of the sun was, was getting eaten up. And this is kind of an overexposed photo, but I didn't know what I was doing. You can see the clouds clearing away. Then they covered up again. Then they clear away. And you can still see there are some clouds because the picture is fuzzy. And just as the first diamond ring was happening, that last cloud cleared away. We had a beautifully total, beautifully clear total solar eclipse. Within 10 or 15 minutes, the sky was completely overcast. Anyone here at that February 26, 1979 total solar eclipse? No? You were? Where were you? Cloudy? Cloudy? Yeah. Darn. In, where, where were you? Uh, east, of Portland. east of Portland. Yeah, you had to be on the ridge of the Cascades or slightly east. Yeah. Anyway, it was amazing. I mean, that, in fact, let me, let me, I don't want to expose that yet. I came home and I visited my parents and I was crying by the whole emotion of the entire experience. It's very, very moving. I know I sound like an idiot, okay? 
and you may have seen partial ones, and they're a cool, interesting geometrical oddity, and definitely go see the partial one, and I'll talk about that in a few minutes. But if you have a chance to see totality, you really should, because it's very, very different. 99% eclipsed versus totally eclipsed is like the difference between being not pregnant and pregnant. It's a very, very big difference. You can't be 99% pregnant, okay? No, really. It's, uh, and I'm not even a woman. I don't know, even know what, how, how to experience it. But uh, anyway, so. Let's turn up the sound. I'm not paying people, okay, to react this way. The totality hasn't even started. Okay, right about now. Watch. There it goes, okay? So it looks like a black hole in the sky. But it's not a black hole, but I study black holes, but whatever. These are genuine reactions. No one's being told to react this way. I don't think they even know they're being taped. That might be illegal, but whatever. Wow. <laughs> that, that was Alan Dyer there. Yes. Oh, the look at that, that was me. Look at the shadow cone. Okay, there's that shadow cone, Alan Dyer is saying. Shadow cone right there. So the people That's over the here boundaries of the shadow. do not see a total eclipse. Oh, yeah. All right, so a couple of minutes later, this was a long eclipse. Okay, people had settled down a little bit, okay? 10 minutes after, a few minutes after totality, this cloud parked itself in front of the sun for 10 minutes. We were very, very lucky. Chromosphere in the bottom. Okay, it's ending, watch this. Coming out. Diamond ring. The beginnings and ends are really something, okay? But the upcoming one is so short, probably no one will completely settle down. Anyway, so that gives you some idea. A picture is worth a thousand words, a video is worth a thousand pictures, but uh, being there is worth a thousand of those, okay, a thousand videos. All right, well, you might wonder, you know, there's a new moon every month. The word month comes from the lunar cycle. So uh, why don't we get an eclipse every time there's a new moon or a lunar eclipse every time there's a full moon? And that's because there's a five degree angle in the orbital plane of the moon around Earth and Earth around the sun. So usually the moon is a little bit above the sun or a little bit below the sun during new moon. And you need these special conditions for them to line up. That happens roughly every 16 months or so. There are 74 total eclipses plus or minus per century, okay? Usually you don't get one. You get some partial eclipses usually each year when uh, this alignment isn't completely off, but not perfect either. You can get a maximum of seven lunar plus solar eclipses per calendar year, most of which are partial. And usually you don't get seven. Usually it's just a couple. Anyway, um, the moon of course orbits Earth, and so this little tiny shadow that it casts moves along Earth at one or 2,000 miles an hour. Now, Earth is rotating in the same direction, so it partly catches up with it, but not completely, and so the Shadow races across Earth's surface. Here's a satellite view from July of 1991 where the picture is taken every half an hour, 45 minutes, something like that. And you can see this uh, shadow of the moon marching across Earth's surface, okay? That one went over Hawaii, most of Hawaii, but not all of it was clouded out. That's that particular path of totality. I was with uh, my parents right here between Cabo San Lucas and La Paz. We had a beautiful totality, a very long one, six and a half minutes, went near the theoretical maximum. The 2009 eclipse, that long one that I showed the video of, is related to the 1991 eclipse, which is why it was so long. Most of the U.S. had a partial eclipse. Maybe in Maine they did not, but most of the U.S. did. Mexico City had totality. I believe the largest urban area ever to have experienced totality, 15 million people. Most of those people were not properly educated. They were told to stay inside, not watch the eclipse. They would go blind if they were to do so. I will teach you that you will not go blind. You can look at totality with, without any filters whatsoever. You can even look at it through a telescope or binoculars. It's the partial phases you need to worry about, but there are ways easily of staying safe. Okay. So here are the, here's the current quarter century of eclipse paths. That's it. Each one covers only half a percent to a percent of Earth's surface, okay? This is the full set over the current quarter century. So, you know, you have to be pretty lucky. 
uh, total solar eclipses are rare. Roughly one will come and visit you every 380 years if you don't make an effort. Now you could get lucky next year, this year. You know, there's 12 and a half million people live along this year's path of totality. So they don't have to do anything unless it's cloudy, then they might want to drive somewhere else. But, you know, that's those 12 and a half million people. What about the other seven plus billion people? They're not going to get to see this one unless they go to the right place. So generally the eclipse won't come to see you, you have to go see it. If you live 5,000 years, you have a 99% probability of having had a total eclipse come to you. But you have to live 5,000 years to be up to 99%, okay? So great excuse to vacation in exotic lands. If you have the time and the means to, and the desire to explore the world, and no particular order in which to explore the world, you might as well go to a place that's going to have a total eclipse and spend a week or two there, and then the eclipse will be the cherry on top, right? So uh, Noel and I, last uh, a year ago in March, we're off the coast of Sulawesi here. We were on a, this, this is the total thing right there. Partial phases are visible from that big area there, okay? Partial eclipses occur roughly once or twice a year everywhere, anywhere pretty much. So anyway, um, there's that little path. We were off the coast of Sulawesi. We spent two weeks bopping around the islands of Indonesia. It was something we had wanted to do anyway. And I was at a lecturer on a cruise telling people how the, to observe the eclipse safely. So it was a good trade, okay? So anyway, um, so that's the full sequence from that particular eclipse. And I've, I've forgotten what this little creature is named, but uh, that was taken by our friends David and Linda Cornfield. All right, so going back to this set of paths, I've told you about eclipses in general. How about the one coming up, all right? So this path here is marked August 21st, 2017, all right? Well, here it is, folks. Partial eclipse everywhere in North America, pretty much, okay? Even Central America. But totality, just a path 60 to 70 miles wide. Okay, let's watch it coming in. Central duration is giving there. The time in England from which you need to subtract seven hours is given there. I'm not kidding. I got an email message from someone yesterday, no, a few days ago, saying, hey, I've got a group of friends and we've chartered an airplane and if we, live, if we leave San Francisco at noon, we'll get to some place in Wyoming, we'll watch the eclipse and then we'll come back. I wrote back, good luck on your trip, but if you leave San Francisco at noon, the eclipse will be over. He was looking at the universal time, the time in England. This is where, in answer to the question before, yes, timing is everything. And location, 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 right? Not just in Aspen, but for an eclipse as well. All right, so there you go. Central duration from two to two minutes and 45 seconds if uh, you're on that blue path right there. But if you're anywhere within the red zones, you'll have some amount of duration of totality. And in fact, you don't have to be right on the blue path. I'll have more to say about that in a few minutes. Salem is excellent. Eugene is close, but not close enough. Portland is close, but not close enough. Close enough is only good enough in, in horseshoes or whatever they say. Boise, Idaho, great if you live there, but you got to move it. You got to get out of there. Got to go. You know, there's a little road that goes to the northwest, I think, and there's some other roads as well. Casper, Wyoming, excellent. You'll see a map I have in a few minutes of the population of people that's possibly going to go there. Uh, Lincoln, Nebraska. Yeah, near the edge, the duration will be pretty short, but they'll get a longer diamond ring and stuff, um, whatever. Nashville, Tennessee, quite good location. Charleston, South Carolina. Anyway, August 21st, don't miss it, totally awesome. Well, there's a new postage stamp, came out two days ago, made for the first time a postage stamp with thermochromic ink. I didn't even know what that word meant until a couple of months ago when I heard about this stamp. Thermochromic ink, thermo, heat, chromic, color. If you stick your thumb on the moon, it changes to a full moon image. Yes, you can go to the US post office. I own no stock in US postage, okay? But anyway, 
we're, how many did we buy? A thousand of them or something? Yeah, because for the rest of my, oh, they're, they're forever stamps. That's the other good thing. You know, you can use them in 20 years when prices have gone up a lot. They're still 49 or whatever it is cents. I don't even know what they are now, but uh, uh, they're, for, oops, they're forever stamps. So the computer does this once in a while, and the easiest way to get it to come back is to just hit that. And if I'm lucky, this will still work. Oh, yes, it did. On a pane, on the back, the back of the stamp pane, a whole bunch of stamps stuck together is called a pane. I also didn't know that until a few months ago. But there it is, the path of the eclipse. Not on a single stamp, but on a pane of stamps. Yes, okay. Well, you know, try to be there and experience this. But, as you will see here, most of the 300 plus million people living in the US, and then those in Canada and Mexico, will not get a total eclipse. And the total eclipse is on a Monday. It's a work day for, in some districts, a school day. You might be in a job where you just can't get away, or you just don't want to, or whatever. Um, you don't want to go where all the crowds will go. So the partial phases will be nice to view as well. And here's, uh, so uh, let's just see here. Denver's right around there, right? So Aspen's right around here. You're going to get a 90% eclipse sun from Aspen. That's pretty good, yeah. From San Francisco, 80% eclipse sun. All right, from Chicago, 90%. Anyway, there's the various partial phase magnitudes, and you can go to a really excellent site called greatamericaneclipse.com. It's got all kinds of useful information. Uh, timing is important. So I noticed here that here's a contour they have labeled 1030 PDT, Pacific Daylight Time. Well, that's true, but it's in Arizona and western Utah, and they're on mountain time. Yeah. Now, if they get there at 1030, at least they're early. That's okay. That's better than being an hour late, right? But here, I looked it up. Doesn't show up so well on this screen, but these are the states that are on Pacific time, and northern Idaho is on Pacific time, but interestingly, southern Idaho is not. Even parts of eastern Oregon are on mountain time. But anyway, most of that contour, I claim, is in the mountain time zone, and so they should have labeled it mountain time, although this technically is not incorrect. 1030 PDT is the same thing as 1130 mountain time, but, but they labeled the other ones correctly, so why not this one? But whatever. Anyway. So, adjust for your time zone if you travel or sleep in or something. So let's look at this again. Um, Aspen, as I said, 90% eclipsed. More than that, it'll look something like this, but it'll take an hour and a half or so or more to, to go through those different phases, okay? The partial phases, now here it's labeled correctly, see in Idaho, it's not that the sun took an hour and six minutes, not that the shadow took an hour and six minutes to get to there. No, it took six minutes to get from there to there. This is when the partial eclipse begins. It took six minutes, plus you're in the next time zone. Same thing, 15 minutes, okay, great. But not an hour and 14 minutes in Nebraska later. It's only 14 minutes later in Nebraska, but again, you're in the next time zone. So down in South Carolina, it starts in the early afternoon, totalities in the mid-afternoon. But you're here, so these places are closer, and they are likely to have better weather as I'll explain. Plus, just being in Aspen, you're likely to have good weather. And um, my colleagues Keith and David are organizing a solar eclipse day. Has to be this particular day. They have no control over that. From 9.30 a.m. to 1 p.m. Now, you'll notice that the partial eclipse starts actually about 10.20 or so in Colorado. But they're starting it early so that you can make little things I'll describe and other little gadgets that they'll describe, but you want to make your own solar eclipse viewer and stuff. So they are wisely starting early so that you have an hour to get prepared for when the partial phases begin. And the whole thing ends at around, I think, 1.10 or 1.11, something like that. Um, actually, 1.11, there you go. So maybe Keith and David, maybe make it end at 1.15 so that those who want to view the whole thing will not be bullied off of the field with you. But no, I'm just kidding. At the Pitkin County Library, 
And they will be handing out these little cards at the end of my talk. And I'll remind you of this at the end of my talk as well. So if you can't go to totality, definitely experience the partial phases. It'll be fun. Definitely a lot of fun. Eye safety, very important. To directly view the partial eclipse, you must use a special filter that blocks all but one part in 100,000 of the optical light and 100% of the ultraviolet and infrared light, which could damage your eyes. So that's uh, very important to have the right kind of filter. Regular or polarized sunglasses just won't cut it, folks. No, not, in, not, in, not even close, okay? You can get something called Shade 14 Welder's Glass or CE Certified Solar Filter, Aluminized Mylar, Black Polymer Sheet. You can find these things online. Most companies that sell these are quite reputable. They would have tons of lawsuits against them if they were not reputable, if they were selling filters that didn't work. This is not a, a good field in which to try to jip your or fool your customers. Not that I'm excusing jipping or fooling your customers in any sale, but this is definitely one that will come back and bite you because you'll have lawsuits. So most of the things you'll find online, especially from companies called um, Thousand Oaks Optical, and Rainbow Symphony and things like that. They're, they're good. So here's shade 14 welder's glass. This is, uh, this is too dark even for most welding purposes. So welding supply houses make it through special order or keep a small supply on hand. They're all out. They've been out for months. It's all bought up. Yeah, they're maybe perhaps making more, but my latest order is coming in from China somewhere and they don't guarantee that it'll come in by August 21st. So those are largely uh, gone. This is a logarithmic scale, so interesting idea. You could add two sevens together, just stack them up together, or an eight and a six, and you might get some internal reflections. But if you want a piece of sturdy glass, eight and six is 14, and seven and seven is 14. And the log of a product turns out to be the sum of the logs, if you go back to your math. Um, anyway, it'll look kind of greenish through that kind of a filter. Some people are bothered by that. I'm not bothered by that. Here are my brother and I in... Mongolia, August 1st, 2008, where we've mounted our shade 14 glass on, um, on a sheet of cardboard, which has the extra advantage that it's easier to hold. The cardboard also shields your face from the sun, put some sunscreen on, of course, anyway. And you can bend the corners around and shade more of your face. That was my 13th eclipse south of the Cape Verde Islands off the west coast of Africa. And here are people in the 2009 eclipse with FedEx boxes and priority mail and things like that. You can even stick one of these pieces of glass in a box with a hole cut in it and cover your head entirely. That gives you a greater feeling of seclusion, perhaps. Uh, you can decorate your box if you wish. You know. Yeah. So you can do all kinds of fun things. And believe me, you have plenty of time, an hour and 15 minutes on the way up to totality to do other things. These guys are useful. They're only a buck a piece, at least when ordered in quantity. And we have enough, I think, for one per family. Get one on your way out. My kids, Capri and Orion, are going to be handing them out. Not during the lecture, because that would be a, a distraction. But these are excellent. Um, they are CE certified, which means they're correct. You'll, you'll say, gosh, I don't see anything. That's the point. You don't see anything in this. Actually, I can barely see that really bright light bulb. But if you're looking at my kids and stuff, I don't see anything. That's the point. It cuts out almost all the light. Anyway, um, here's a woman in Peru enjoying the eclipse with one of those glasses, you know, on a very rocky field. We slept here in 1994 because we were afraid that the Peruvian authorities might close the road the morning of the eclipse and demand $50,000 to get up to the viewing location. They could have. I don't know what the, that they did or not. So we went up there the night before, cleared out some rocks, and decided to sleep there. When you're desperate, you'll do anything. Uh, you can get this stuff called black polymer, polymer or mylar sheets. Those are really useful too. You can cut them up and make filters. Um, you can stick those in a hole on a cardboard sheet and just tape it securely. Um, those are very inexpensive. They're, uh, they give a, a yellowish to orange hue to the sun. Binoculars with a filter. If you want to look through binoculars, you have to block the light at the front end before the binoculars have collected the light. If you block the light here, your filter might heat up and, um, and become damaged, and then the light will go into your eye and will burn it. And uh, by the time you start feeling pain, it's too late. 
because your retina does not have pain sensors. By the time you start feeling pain, means your eye is a hard-boiled egg, okay? And it's too late. So it's very dangerous, the partial phases. It's not that the sunlight is intrinsically more dangerous when the moon is partly in front of it. It's not, it's not emitting some weird rays. It's that there's an interesting curiosity and you are more tempted to look at it when you know there's a partial eclipse going on. That's the danger. All right, securely tape the shade 14 glass or approved solar filter to the front end. And here's an example, the same binoculars, but I took off the filter so I could look at birds and mountains here in Aspen. Uh, here's some people using them correctly. There's someone who put that mylar film or the black polymer, the stuff that's cheap to get online, taped it securely to the binoculars. Preferably you have another set of binoculars that you can use during totality because you don't want to be sitting there using precious seconds ripping your filter off and all the gooey tape and all that, right? Maybe have one that is secure but comes off easily that you remove like that or something. But anyway, uh, filter on a telescope or a telephoto lens, that'll give you a magnified view. You can see the sunspots more clearly. The filter, again, should not be at the eyepiece end. It could heat up and crack. Put it on the end closest to the sun. So here is... Um, the son of one of my colleagues, Inca de Potter, in 1991, correctly viewing the partial phases through a telescope. Here is a correctly filtered telescope at the visitor's center on Mauna Kea Mountain on the way up to the Keck and other telescopes. This is correct. If you don't have that there, you have an eyepiece down here, then there could be a real problem because you've got a big telescope collecting a lot of light. This is why we use telescopes. They're like gigantic eyes that collect light. One of my teaching assistants at Berkeley once pointed the telescope on our roof toward the sun um, and did not have the filter up there, but he had an eyepiece cover, a plastic eyepiece cover right there. And here's what happened to it. Yeah, imagine your eye being um, that plastic eyepiece cover. So it's dangerous. Here's a very safe way to view the sun indirectly. You punch a hole through an opaque sheet, like a piece of cardboard. Good pinhole size is a pencil or a pen width. A luminous object sends rays out. The rays go through the hole, end up there and there. So you get an upside down, an inverted image of your object. Who cares? You know, the sun looks the same. Right side up, upside down. All right. A small pinhole will give you a sharper but dimmer image. A big pinhole will give you a a fuzzier but brighter image. Fuzzier because there are more angles through which the light could enter. So here I have put in a bunch of holes. By the way, here's one of these things. Here was for my 15th eclipse. Got to orient it correctly, 15. But there, there are my older son's name. Simon has uh, been carved out. And there's a bunch of partially eclipsed sun images. And if you're viewing the partial eclipse, which you'll be doing either on the path of totality or off of the path of totality, you might as well enjoy it with some celestially themed candy. And again, I, aim, I own no stock with Eclipse gum, Orbit gum, Starburst, Milky Way, Mars bars, but it adds to the whole experience, okay? Here I've punched out my younger son's name, Orion, and in fact, there's a bunch of partially eclipsed suns, Orion. Next time I'll make the spacing between the letters a bit bigger to make it a bit more distinct. Sorry about that, bud. But anyway, and there, you can use a colander to, with uh, much sharper holes than you typically get with a pencil or a pen. And the colander then produces sharper images of the sun. Not perfectly sharp because, again, the colander holes are not infinitesimally small. And so there's a range of angles along which the sunlight can enter. And that's what leads to fuzzy images of this sort when you don't have a series of lenses with which to bring stuff to a focus. So there's no, no lens, no plastic, no glass, just, just a pinhole. It's fantastic. It's the simplest camera. You can use your hands to make pinholes. And you might say, well, they're not round. They don't have to be round. They can be square. You're making an image of the object, not an image of your hole. And so indeed, look at that. There they are. Fun things to do during the partial phases. Partial eclipses are a lot of fun, especially a 90% eclipse sun like here in Aspen, but 100 is better. Okay, so here are images of the sun formed by holes between leaves in a tree. 
go underneath an aspen tree. Now the, the leaves flutter around a lot, so that might mess up the images. That's what biologically, right? Evolutionarily, I think that's what aspen leaves are supposed to do. But anyway, um, there it is. I was walking around to the bathroom during the partial phases of the 1991 eclipse. Go to the bathroom before totality. All right, and I noticed this under my feet. Best photo I've ever taken of the pinhole camera images formed by holes in a tree. Telescope or binoculars, looks like I'll take my full hour and then we'll take uh, questions, okay. Um, telescope or binoculars, no filter. Well, you can project one or two images on a shadow underneath you. Don't look through the eyepiece if you're projecting the light through the telescope because that means you don't have a filter. You're just collecting a bunch of light which you then project onto a screen. You get a larger and brighter image. That's like a pinhole camera but with a big lens collecting and focusing the light. So here's what you get. A C like this and there's my daughter's name, Capri. All right, my younger daughter. Yeah, so that's about what you'll see here in Aspen, nearly fully eclipsed. Um, here's one projected onto our shadow with some eclipse gum right there. That was with a, a single telescope like this, like a Galileo telescope. You can buy these things or approximate what Galileo's telescope was like. That's a single one. Or if you block one monocular in a binocular, then you'll get that. Or if you uncover both of them, then you get this. And we call this the C cups, you know, so <laughs> anyway. Um, if the skies are clear, you will be happy and you can make a projection that looks like this. You've got to do something during the partial phases. And so Noel came up with this, you know, and that was a little, you know, there's plenty of time to let your creative juices flow, you know. You can even put an eye on one of them, you know, so. Uh, hopefully you'll be in the path of totality, so you'll see something like this. But if, uh, and if you've got clear skies, you can then celebrate, even in, in the partially um, eclipsed regions, celebrate if you have clear skies have some Mai Tais or whatever. Um, you could have some Corona beer. It's not totality without a Corona. Uh, anyway, <laughs> total eclipse photography, um, you know, since I, my time is running out and I knew it would be, don't, especially if this is your first eclipse. Just don't photograph it. Well, maybe one or two pictures, quickly, just for memories. When you're 98 and a half years old and you're flipping through your, your memory book, this will remind you that you saw an eclipse, okay? But there's gonna be plenty of online photos taken by people who are much more expert at this than you are. By the way, I forgot to lie this, load the slides in because today's morning discussion on neutron stars was so fascinating, so I completely forgot to do this. But with Google, UC Berkeley and a number of other institutions are doing an a thing called an eclipse mega movie. If you're a serious photographer, Google, or use your favorite search engine, mine is Google, Eclipse Mega Movie, it'll take you to a site where it'll tell you what we want. If you've got a good lens and you're a serious photographer, you can actually contribute images that will then be stitched together to show the progression over 90 minutes of the eclipse as it crosses the US, the Eclipse Mega Movie. And we'll, we will make a publicly available data archive from which anyone can just peruse the images or try to do citizen science like make various measurements of the inner corona structure, whatever you want to do. It's a citizen science project on a national level. Eclipse mega movie, all right? And even iPhone pictures, you know, submit them. They might not end up being used in the stitch together thing, but they will end up in the repository. There will be many, many terabytes of data. Anyway, it's best if you have an automatic system. You just go click, click, click. Because I've known plenty of people who have spent all their time photographing or trying to photograph an eclipse and then you ask them did you see it and they say well no i never actually looked at it because they're sitting there fiddling around with their lenses yeah they saw it on a viewfinder but you could have done that online that's what they did in mexico city well they didn't have an online in 1991 but you know what i mean they saw it on tv you can see it anywhere on a tv screen that's very different from having the photons hit your own eyes all right many a different exposure times give nice results but put it on a tripod or, or on a rock or something because typically the exposure time will be half a second or a second and you're unlikely to be able to hold the camera still for that long. So put it on a tripod, but expose for a couple of exposures and then put the camera down or just forget about it, okay? Uh, okay, so back to this and how can you experience it. So there's the path. 
And a lot of people in the press will tell you that you gotta be on that blue line. You gotta be on the center line. Well, you don't have to be on the center line. Uh, you have to be somewhere within that path. I'll say more about how far off you can be in a minute. The primary consideration, if you desire to see totality, which you don't necessarily do, see the, see the, um, see the partial phases from here in Aspen or wherever you live. But if your desire is to see totality, the foremost consideration is to be within that band. The secondary consideration is weather, right? It's a different experience if you're completely clouded. Now, Gordon told me he saw one in the 50s or experienced one, but it was completely cloudy. So it got dark, and that's something. But if you don't see the diamond ring and the corona, then, then you haven't quite seen one, Gordon. So, gosh, just go up there. Anyway, here's monthly cloud cover. With some variations, there's sort of a monotonic pattern, clearer in the west than in the east. It's going to be in the morning in the west, so coastal Oregon is not such a good idea because the humid air could form fog, especially as the eclipse is progressing and the sun is being cut off. By the afternoon, the fog is gone on the coast, but the afternoon is too late. Anyway, this is an excellent area for partial phases here, southern Nevada. Anyway, basically, pretty good odds for much of the US, but not perfect odds. Some places will surely be clouded out. Now, a lot of newspapers will say, go to the center line. Here's the center line from the general area we're going to be. I'm not going to tell you exactly where we're going to be because we don't want millions more people there, but we'll be somewhere there, OK? Anyway, turns out you don't have to be right on that line. And I'll give you an example. Suppose you've chosen St. Clair, Missouri, all right? Right there on the center line. And you can go to Xavier Jubier's Eclipse website, and you can Google these things, and you'll land on excellent websites. Two minutes and 40 seconds, total eclipse. Great, wonderful. Only four seconds off from the absolute peak, which is in Hopkinsville, Kentucky, or something like that. Excellent, but do you have to be in St. Clair if you're a Missouri type? No, here's one, now you're, here's the path, here's St. Clair somewhere there. Now you're in Sullivan, Missouri. You're a significant way off the center line. Two minutes and 33 seconds, it's fine. Anything above 20 or 30 seconds, the memory is burned into your brain. The duration is of secondary consideration. Sure, longer is generally better, but not the primary consideration. Clouds and, you know, anyway. Cuba, not Cuba, the country, but Cuba, Missouri. Way off the center line, still within the path. One minute, 50 seconds. Fine. All right, it's not two minutes and 40 seconds, but so what? If that's where you live, or you're trying to get away from the crowds there, that's a fine place to be. And you're considerably off the path, uh, off the center line. Slightly north of St. James, right there. What did I say to begin with? I said St. Clair. Ah, too many saints in Missouri. Anyway, St. James. All right, St. James is slightly off or, or straddling it. So let's go a tiny bit north. 37 seconds. Even that's not bad, OK? So, you don't have to be right on the center line, but you do have to be within the path. Now, in St. James itself, the function plummets, the duration plummets as you get every kilometer closer to the edge. The function is, has a very steep drop. But even slightly north of St. James, you've still got half a minute, which isn't bad. So you can go to various sites, greatamericaneclipse.com. They've been asked, what are the greatest places to see the eclipse from? I keep getting asked, where, where should I go? Well, anywhere within the path of totality where it's clear. Okay, but here they give 10 different places and good reasons to go to each of them. You know, there are different reasons for different places. You know, drive times. Oh, this is from greatamericaneclipse.com. This is very interesting. Zero to two hours, two to four, four to six, six to eight, eight to 10. 12 and a half million people live right on it. Here, drive sheds, kind of like water sheds, are all the little streams that go into the same river, right? That's the watershed area. So these guys have calculated drive paths from every county in the US and where people are likely to go if their primary consideration is the shortest drive time, okay? So they look like, I mean, this is like the Mississippi River or something, right? But uh, not quite. So this is very interesting. So here's one. Here's an important one, the one that's relevant to Aspen and New Mexico and eastern Arizona and, you know, northwestern or, let's say, western Texas. 
It's some little place in Wyoming, Glendo, Wyoming. Casper is right there somewhere. So there are 8.6 million Americans within driving distance of Glendo, Wyoming. Does that mean that 8.6 million people are going to go? No, probably not. So they try to do some estimates. They do an optimistic estimate of 2% within 200 miles, half of that within 400, half of that still within 800. But anyway, maximum they think of 2%, minimum they think half a percent. And then they figure out how many people are going to be at each of these major locations. I think for some of their locations, 2% is a severe underestimate. For example, they are estimating that only about a million people are going to come to Oregon. 900,000, I think they are estimated. I think that's woefully inadequate because Interstate 5 just goes straight up to Oregon, and there's 40-some million people in California. So I, I don't know. And there's a lot in Canada and stuff, too. So, but anyway, they've made an attempt to figure out where to go. 27% of the nation lives within 200 miles of the path of totality. 87.9 million people, folks. They think that up to 2% of those will go. I don't know. In some places, it'll be less. In some places, I think it'll be more. Their number one biggest corridor, I forgot to load it, South Carolina. There's some town there that um, is within range of 90 million people. The whole eastern corridor, their shortest driving time is Columbia, South Carolina, or something like that. I don't know South Carolina very well, but uh, 90 million people. <laughs> well, I doubt it, but they say that especially if you live in the east, you've got to be really worried about traffic. Hotels have been sold out along the path for a year. The ones that remain are $1,000 a night, three-night minimum. I kid you not. If you find a better deal, great, tell your friends about it. So I suggest you find a place off of the path and then drive in that day as early as possible from an hour, two hours, three hours, wherever you can find something affordable. Motel 6s are going for $600 a night, folks, <laughs> is what people have told me. Yeah. Anyway, some excellent websites. Um, just use your favorite search engine. August 2017, Total Solar Eclipse, Path of Totality. That'll land you on some of these things. I'll give you a moment to take a photograph if you want. Then I just have a few things to say in the remaining minute. And then we'll open up for, the, for questions for about 15 minutes. Last week's public talk went till 6.45, so I feel entitled to that too. Okay, everyone's taking a picture. If you miss this one, fear not. Look at that. April 8, 2024. Crossing in southern Illinois. Just an interval of seven years. You might say, what about this 380 years I told you about? That's the average, folks. Yeah, doesn't mean that some places aren't, aren't uh, privileged. Anyway, even if you do see this one, see this one as well. The corona will have changed. If you're watching the diamond ring, the one coming in, you won't see the shadow approaching. There, there's so many things to see and do. Enjoy. And uh, if you're here in Aspen, go to the Pitkin County Library in Aspen and... Um, and enjoy the Eclipse event that's being set up for you here. And on your way out, uh, pick up one of these per family. Okay. And we'll let those who uh, need to go, go now. And I'll open it up for questions. Maybe five minutes of questions, and then we'll do a graceful exit, and I'll do 10 minutes more questions. Yes. Oh, David, David who's organizing this. Ah, so if you're going there on the 21st, don't pick up one here so that more people can pick. Telescopes and things, but also our weekly physics barbecues for kids kick off. We're actually on the 28th of June down at the Salt Yellman Hotel. The first one in Aspen is July 5th, and Alex is going to be there talking to kids all about the eclipse. Yes, but without slides, just six big posters, and I'll tell them about it. Yes, right there. And I'll, I'll, I'll repeat the questions for the benefit of everyone. Yeah. I noticed that the shadows yes. are narrow. Ah, very good question. The shadows are narrowish near the equator and wide at the poles. Two reasons for that. One physical and one that's an artifact of the map. The one that's an artifact of the map is that this is a Mercator projection. Lines of longitude converge 
When you spread them out on a Mercator projection, it makes the area gigantic, which is why Greenland looks uh, about as big as the whole US. I mean, it's a big place, but it's not as big as the continental US. So you're getting an artificial widening of the paths for that reason. But there's also a physical widening. Imagine the shadow, here it's a beam of light, but the shadow hitting near the equator, especially when the sun is overhead. It's round. When it's hitting near a pole, it's hitting relatively tangent to the sphere. It gets broadened out into an ellipse, right? right? It's an ellipse, and so it takes up more area physically. Plus, it gets broadened out by the Mercator projection. So those are the two reasons that they look smaller. Um, and they're not all equally small at the equator because sometimes the moon just barely covers the sun. So the width of the shadow is very narrow, 10 kilometers maybe. Sometimes the moon in its elliptical orbit is closer than average, sometimes much closer. Sometimes you get the super moon effect that the media makes to make way too big a deal out of. You know. But the eclipse is a big deal. The super moon is not a big deal. There were three of them in 2016 alone. So you know it can't be a big deal. But anyway, when the moon is big, because it's close to Earth, you get one of the eclipses that lasts four, five, six, even theoretically seven minutes. Okay, and that's then necessarily also a wide path. Okay, uh, I saw, yes, question right over there. Thank you, yes. The other thing is you can collect t-shirts from uh, various eclipses that you attend. Yeah, so the question is, uh, should you use a smartphone because it could damage your optics? Maybe. I don't want to be sued by a bunch of people whose smartphones got messed up. But I know that with my iPhone, I've taken pictures of the sun. And mine may be a special one, but it hasn't gotten damaged. But you didn't hear it from me. <laughs> the eclipse would be no brighter a sun than the uneclipsed sun. So I think... It's OK, but it could be dependent on whether you have a Samsung or, or an iPhone or something else. Maybe take a picture on one that you're about to get rid of. You're upgrading to a newer model. Take a picture of the uneclipsed sun and see if your iPhone got damaged. Yes? Where will I be? I'll be somewhere in Oregon. That's a very big place. On the ground? On the ground, yes. I've seen one from the airplane. An interesting point, by the way. I saw one from an airplane, March 20th, 19, uh, sorry, 2015, because it crossed land only over the Faroe Islands, which were predicted to be largely cloudy, and they were largely cloudy, and Svalbard, which is way north of mainland Norway, which was predicted to be cloudy, but turned out to be clear. But the North Atlantic was predicted to be cloudy, and very few cruise ships want to go in March to the North Atlantic at high northern latitudes. So uh, we were part of a, a group that chartered some airplanes. And it was an interesting thing. It was total, and it was, it was longer than usual, because at 500 miles an hour, we could partly keep up with the 1,000-mile-an-hour shadow. So it made it a four-and-a-half-minute eclipse instead of a three-minute eclipse. But we didn't have the changing temperatures. We weren't surrounded by people. We had a narrow tube of people, two per row. So it's not... There weren't animals other than humans nearby whose reactions you could... So it's different from an airplane. I suggest on the ground if you have... If you're on a plane higher, you're up. You go on and up to get to see it. Yeah, if you're higher up, you were saying what? You get to see the eclipse longer. The total shadow. You get to see it longer if you're flying along the shadow. That's correct. You don't get to see it longer if you're hovering in, an, in a helicopter. The higher off of the altitude on the Earth. Oh, the altitude on the Earth. That brings you only marginally closer to the moon, making the moon only look marginally bigger. So that's an extremely minor effect. Yes, right there. Uh, thank you so much for your talk. It's so informative. Oh, oh, thank you. If you were in the Tetons, which is. Ooh, the Tetons, an excellent place. And your friend said, oh, you have to get to the top of the mountain, but it'd be pretty hard to leave that. No, no, no. She's asking Tetons, but your son says, go to the top of the mountain. Your sun is incorrect. In fact, the rising moist air tends to produce clouds. That's why mountaintops often are cloudy and the dry valleys below them are not. So you're worse off being up on the 
flanks of the Tetons or on the top of the mountain. Be down in Jackson Hole or something like that. That's certainly one of the more scenic places I can think of along the path from which to view totality. Uh, yes, right there, and then I'll go to you. What do, oh, the animals. The animals get all freaked out. What am I saying about the animals? The animals don't know what's going on. The roosters start crowing because they think it's twilight. Um, cows come out to graze. Uh, deer will come out maybe, you know, here in Aspen. Birds stop or start singing depending on the type of bird. Ask people who have seen them from a ground in an area that had animals around it and they will tell you that the animals knew that something weird was going on, but had not heard my talk, so they didn't know exactly what was going on. But, uh, yes, right there. Is there any scientific significance? Oh, yes, there is scientific significance. And um, the Eclipse Mega Movie will allow solar astronomers to study the inner parts of the corona. Now, we have satellites up there. There's a solar and heliospheric observatory, SOHO, that's monitoring the, the sun 24-7 for coronal mass ejections and other things that might hurt us. But for technical reasons, their occulting disk, their version of the moon, more than covers the photosphere, the disk. It covers the inner corona as well. And that's because the light would basically ref you know, diffract around the disk and mess up the image if they, you know, if they just covered the photosphere of the sun. So they can't monitor what's going on in the inner corona. During an eclipse, you can. And especially 90 minutes worth of an eclipse, all right, you can see changes in the inner corona, which then a few hours later might manifest themselves in the changes that the SOHO satellite sees in the mid and outer corona. Okay? So uh, those are one of the things that, that people will be studying. Yes, way in the very back there. Oh, yeah. So, so, so very, very briefly, Einstein's theory, since you happen to mention it, <laughs> we're just sort of one year past the centennial celebration of his wacky theory of the warping of space and the passage of time, which is not just intellectual titillation for theorists, which are most of the Aspen Center for Physics participants, but also observers like myself. It actually has a, an important modern use. Can anyone uh, say what it is? GPS, that's right. The satellites up there have clocks that run slightly more quickly because of the general relativistic effect than the clocks down here. And so we have to take that into account. Engineers did. But anyway, here's this warping. So here's the idea. If the sun weren't there, the true positions of stars would be this. And in fact, you know, it would be just that the, the ray enters your eye from this direction or from that direction. But what happens when the sun is there is that, you know, it gets gradually bent. I've drawn it as two straight lines here, but it gets bent. And so it enters your eye. Your brain doesn't necessarily know that it got bent. I mean, you might know it, but your eye-brain combination doesn't see that. It sees that the apparent position is there or there. So the positions are slightly different by a, by a tiny, tiny amount. And the amount is smaller for stars that, whose, whose paths don't graze the edge of the sun. Well, you might say you can't test this prediction because the sun makes the sky bright at night. And by the way, you can't just create an eclipse during the day by blocking the sun with a tennis ball because the light has then already been scattered by Earth's atmosphere, making a bright blue sky brighter than the corona. You gotta block the light by the moon or by the SOHO uh, optical occulting disk or whatever. But it turns out, of course, when the moon is there, the gravitational effect is negligible. Some people think that it's the total eclipse that causes this. No, it is not the total eclipse that causes this. It is the total eclipse that makes it visible. This thing darkens the sky measurably. And you saw, if you were lucky, in one of those pictures there, I mean, it's too bright in here, but you can actually see stars in the photographs. So you compare, uh, there, you can see them. See that? There, 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 there. You can compare the positions of stars in a photograph taken during a total eclipse with a photograph taken six months later, or earlier usually, you do it, you anticipate that you're gonna do this measurement so you can make the comparison right away. You took a picture six months earlier when the sky was in the opposite side, the, the sun was in the opposite side of the sky as seen by Earth. So then what you see is the true positions of the stars. And Arthur Eddington did this in 1919, and he measured this displacement. 
by today's standards, not a compelling measurement, but historically, it made Einstein an overnight celebrity. He became very famous among the general public, not just among physicists, which by 1919 he already was. But the results agreed pretty well with Einstein's predictions. Subsequent measurements have been done uh, more quantitatively confirming this, including a 1922 expedition to Australia by Lick Observatory astronomers. And I'm associated with the University of California's Lick Observatory. So, uh, so that's the effect, by the way. Here's the New York Times. And, and this, is, this is not fake news. This is real news, OK? <laughs> Lights all askew in the heavens. Men, unfortunately, especially in this area of physics, there were few, very few women working at the time. But anyway, humans of science, more or less agog over results of eclipse observations. A book for 12 wise men. Well, there's an anecdotal story, probably apocryphal. But an, a, a reporter supposedly asked Eddington, so great Dr. Professor Eddington, it is said that only three people in the world understand Einstein's theory of relativity. And supposedly, Eddington looked down and rubbed at his chin and then said, hmm, can't think of who the third would be. <laughs> Einstein himself and no one else. But general relativity is actually not hard to understand. The mathematics becomes hard. But anyway, uh, so, uh, so that's, that's, that's that. OK, yes. Yes. So, yeah, right there. I've been asked by many people already here. I know many people might have this question, but this is counterintuitive to most people's daily experience. They experience shadows coming towards them from the east to the west. Ah, yes. Shadows come towards you usually from the east to the west. Right. Well, so. Yeah, so um, if you look at, at one of these paths, just to go back to the path. There we go. Um, if you look at the orbital motion of the moon, right, it's the same direction as the rotation of Earth. Now, the rotation of Earth is from west to east, right? I mean, the sun rises in the east, sets in the west. If you think about that, that means that looking from you know, above, sort of it's counterclockwise, I guess, but it's you know, California's chasing after New York is a way to think of it, right? But, but the moon's orbital motion is in that same direction, west to east. So the shadow comes in from the west and goes toward the east. Because the moon is following the same sense of rotation as Earth, but just faster. At least the projection of the shadow on Earth's surface is faster. Uh, you know, uh, do we have time for one or two more? Yeah. OK, go ahead. My understanding that if you're, if you're on the equator, Ah. That the Earth is rotating about a thousand miles an hour. Yeah, on the equator. It's on the North Pole, you just rotate with it. Well, that's right. Yeah, yeah. On the North Pole. With a twenty-three degree adjustment. Yeah. To the tilt. Okay. Yeah. How? What is the the speed of the Moon? Ah. Uh, what is the speed of the Moon? So, right. So the moon's distance is 250,000 miles. Yes. OK. So 2 pi times that is 6 times 250,000. So that's 1.5 million miles in 30 days. That's 1.5 times 10 to the 6. That's 15 times 10 to the 5 divided by 3 times 10 to the 1. So that's 5 times 10 to the 4 miles per per day, sorry, f 5 times 24, 50,000 miles per day, divided by 24, so that's roughly 2,000 2, miles an hour. hour. Woohoo! It worked. OK, it, it, it roughly worked. I didn't just feed you a bunch of baloney, and I just figured out. I feel like I'm in my PhD qualifying exams. No, we had to do this kind of stuff. They throw things at us that we didn't anticipate. And we have to stand there and figure them out. Right. Yeah. Can I ask a follow-up? Uh, let, me, let me let someone else ask it, and then you can, you can ask one uh, as I'm putting my stuff away. Uh, I think there was another question out there. If not, you can ask your follow-up question. OK, go ahead. Is your IQ in three digits to the 10th power? <laughs> you know what? I don't know my IQ, and I don't want to know. I've never been told. And the reason, the reason I don't want to know is if it's some really high number, 
then I'll say that, oh man, you know, I'm just an observational astronomer. I'm not some high-powered theorist like this guy, you know, and, and I really haven't done all that much. And if it's really low, I'll say, man, I'm just, you know, I'm just really stupid, you know, and, which isn't a bad thing, you know, but I just don't even really want to know, right? I, I, I'm happy with my life and how my science has taken me, and I've enjoyed it tremendously. And, and by the way, by the way, I've seen 15 total solar eclipses. Not a single one of them was for the purpose of taking scientifically useful data, and especially not data that I would then deal with. I don't, this isn't my area of expertise. My co-author, Jay Pasikoff, on an introductory astronomy textbook, studying the sun is his, is his thing. He goes to all these because he actually takes data. But I just go for the sheer magnificence and enjoyment. Believe me, trust me, they really are something, and you have a chance. You know, 99% of the population of the U.S. is within 900 miles. If you go back to this thing here, oh, I've got it right there. Here's Aspen. You're within 200 miles. So go to see the partial eclipse for sure here if you can't go to see the total one. I don't want to, I don't want to discourage you from seeing the partial eclipse, but if you're, if you don't have work or something that absolutely fixates you to Aspen that day or the weekend before it, trust me, take a, take a road trip. If there's not something that fixes you to Aspen that weekend on Monday, there are a lot of jets that do it. Well, there are, yeah, yeah, be careful because a lot of people have that same idea. And Aspen has a lot of people that do have those jets, but the FAA, we were. They may be restricting flights that day because so many people, by the way, are flying to Jackson Hole, another place that a lot of people with jets like to fly to. And so be careful if at the last minute you ask your friend, hey, you got a jet, I've got a neat place to go and I'll, I'll give you a martini or something, you know, in exchange. Because uh, the FAA may, may have, you know, there might even be a waiting list now. Uh, I actually don't know. I don't have access to a private jet. But. Okay, well, th th thank you so much, and, and good luck, you know.